I think we're hot. Hopefully the intro rolled. All righty. All right. Well, I got to hype you. Don't talk yet. I'm going to hype my guests. You're not here yet. You don't exist. Okay, Shh. All right. I want to give a special thanks. First, the sponsors. Head over to www.johnbartoloshow.com. Go check out a complete list of the sponsors there. I want to thank a few of them now. Rhino Metals, Gallo Technology, Blackwater Ammunition. Get your ammo today. Pulsar Thermal Imaging Technology. Don't make it difficult. Hunt at night. Get a thermal. You know? Watch those neighbors. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Sig Hour. Go check them out. Everybody loves SIG. Right on optics. If you're buying an optic and you don't want to pay a fortune and you want a quality product, go check out Right On, guys. Appreciate them. Galco Leather Holsters. If you need a holster, go check out Galco. I want to thank Full Quartz and Firearms. Scott Full Quartz and he was in last week, did an episode with Valentina Shevchenko. Go check it out, guys. Scott got his own podcast. Don't message me about that episode. <laughs> go see scott i appreciate you guys i appreciate everyone i got a guest today i'm excited to have on he's a real man he's making it happen i like this guy uh he's he's gonna give me some insight into how to be a man over 40 and i'm really excited about that we got the one and only dr mike simpson what's going on how you doing brother thanks for having me i'm hanging in there we got a little feedback i'm sorry about that it should work itself out okay uh listen this is a great book. You wrote a book, okay? Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. I started flipping through it. A mm -hmm. lot of good nuggets in here. A lot of stuff. What made you write it? Why'd you get into this in the first place? Why'd you want to put this out there? Well, I, part of it was I, I, I was figuring this out on my own for a while because I talked about in the book, I was a little, I, don't, I wouldn't say I was a late bloomer, mm. but um, I've changed careers a lot. And because I've changed careers a lot and I've hopped around a lot, at the age when most guys are kind of shifting down and going, yeah, you know, I had a, I had a successful life. I had a good run. Life. I had a, yeah, I had a good run. It's time to, time to cash it in, time to get the, the Harley and the fat guy shirt and the fat guy hat Ooh. and, you know, just, just hang out on the weekends and, and hit a little white ball around and just kind of chill out. I wasn't really able to do that because I, I went to medical school at age 36. I was an intern at age 40. And then uh, because I had a non-conventional path to get to where I was, right. you know, I'd done 17 years in the military, 17 years mm. in special operations as an operator before I went to med school. And I knew that I wanted to go back to the special operations community. So there I was in this position where I was older than all my peers in medicine. And when I went back to the force uh, as a physician to provide medical care for, you know, the guys out there kicking indoors, I was going to have to keep up with them. So I had to find this recipe right. to stay savage yeah. over the age of 40. So I started kind of piecing this together myself. And luckily, I had a medical background, so that made it a little bit easier. But I also found out there's a lot of disinformation out there. So this was kind of mm. an, on, this was an ongoing process for years. And I would figure stuff out, whether it you know, came to recovery or how it was going to work out, supplements, diet. And I was, I was kind of jotting all this stuff down. Then fast forward uh, late in my career, and I, I started a podcast called Mind of the Warrior, and I was very open about you know who I was, what my background was, and my listeners knew sure. how, how old I was. So I was always getting these emails, and you, you probably get similar emails. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, love your show. I am a blank year old, blank. I've got blank injury. How do you think I should blank? Yeah. Right? Whether it was about shooting, self-defense. Sure. Can I go to jujitsu? Can I still do deadlift? Can I do squats? Can I Olympic lift? All these questions, diet, supplements, everything else. So I was always kind of answering these questions over and over. And sure. Over. And a little voice in the back of my head said, what if you just had one resource where you could go, hey, just click this link or whatever. A better delivery system. I, I, I've, yeah. already, I've already answered all these questions. But I didn't quite make that next breakthrough until I decided, I knew that I wanted to write a book and I actually started to write a completely different book. And then uh, the guys that I was, I was talking to you about, you know, talking yeah. to Max at Scribe Media, I was talking to him and he goes, well, hey, tell me about this Greybeard Performance, this lifestyle brand that you started. I understand you got your, have your own supplements. And I was telling him about that and he goes, well, that's a book. You should write a book that's centered around that. Have you ever have you ever explored that, explored yeah. that? And I go, well, yeah, I'm like, I'm answering like two to three emails a week. He goes, I bet if you go back and look through these emails and look through your old podcast episodes, he goes, I'll bet you got 90% of this book already written. I'm sure. And it, and 90% of the book was what I was doing on a day to day basis. So all I had to do was put that in a format and I, and I wanted it to be in a format 
not like a textbook, not like something that's going to be painful to read, but like if you're reading it, it's like I'm I'm sitting. We're on a long car ride, right? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm I, sitting in the other seat, and and I'm just talking to you. We're very just two conversational, guys exactly. And that yeah. that was my goal in writing. It. You know, it's funny about writing a book. Everybody says the hardest thing to do, and this is when to everybody listening out there, you sit with a ghostwriter or somebody that actually knows what the fuck we're doing, as opposed to us. You you get somebody that can help you lay out the chapters. They say right. that's the hardest part is mm -hmm. getting the thoughts into chapters. Yeah, the framework, yeah. Framework, yeah. They say that's the hardest. I mean, I might could be totally wrong, but when I worked on a couple manuscripts that we published on the website where we, i had to work with someone to dial down the chapters yeah that was the hard part but yeah it's uh it's interesting because there is this giant movement we talked about this a little offline to be more capable mm -hmm. right and i know you see it out there and it's it's for men and women to be more capable and i feel that's at the heart of your message and that's why you know right away the answer was a yes when we were going to get together and i love that idea i love that concept and i feel like at the core of your book it preaches a message to just get to be more capable at whatever age and wherever you're at. Sorry, guys. Jiu-Jitsu cop's trying to call me. He's been trying to call me for two days. Hi, Brian. Uh, but listen, that theme is resonates tremendously. And I totally understand what you're saying, how to dig deeper. And along the way, you kind of uncovered some of the, the cheat codes is the line yeah. I like to use. Yeah, that's a good way uh, to put it. Yeah, and I, I saw a couple of them written in there, but what are the main ones you wanted people to take away in reading the book? What are some of the cheat codes? Is it more, I feel like taking care of yourself is really number one, but yeah. what, what do you feel has to stand out as a bullet point? Uh, the big thing is, uh, two, probably two big things. One is don't let other people tell you what you should or shouldn't be able to do. Amen to right? that, brother. And, and this is not just on an individual level. This oh. is not, this, not just a friend going, yeah, you probably shouldn't be doing that. You know, or a family member or a spouse going, you probably shouldn't be doing that. Also on a societal level, right? Because what is society? I'm 55 years old. Society tells me that I should get more bran mm. and I should walk for, I, if for... And three times a week, I should go for a vigorous walk, yeah. Right. And that it's okay that I'm on probably two blood pressure medicines and they're watching my sugar and my cholesterol and uh, just kind of counting down the days to that first heart attack, you know, yeah. so that I can do the rehab from that first heart attack. That's what society tells me. Right. Right. Well, you know, fuck that. That's not, that's <laughs> not, not real. Program, yeah. That's average because, you know, we, we live in the developed world and we eat a bunch of shit we shouldn't and we don't exercise as much as we should. So that's average, but it's not normal. So that, that's, that's the first thing. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is when you talk about uh, optimizing yourself, being a better version of yourself, remember that when you're doing self-care, whether it's working out, eating right, going to jiu-jitsu, going to Kempo, going to Kyokushin, I don't care, going to boxing class, that's if, not selfish. If you're going to Kempo, you should go to jiu-jitsu. Just a yeah. little disclaimer. Yeah, go just, ahead, go ahead. You know, both. <laughs> Kempo. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it just, it's not selfish to do self-care. Yeah. And it's... A lot of time, you see this. You know, I'm I'm blessed with a with a wife who's totally supportive. In fact, we go to the gym together. But there are people that are in relationships or have familial commitments or work commitments. When they say, "Hey, I'm going to carve out an hour and a half each day, and I'm going to mm. go to the gym," it's like you selfish fuck. Mm -hmm. or you're gonna you know you're gonna go off and and lift weights when you should be spending time with me or spending time with them How or dare you. or working on your TPS reports or some other bullshit. And this isn't selfishness. Self-care is vital to who we are, right? At the end of the day, you know, uh, friends can leave you, family can leave you, romantic entanglements can leave you, your kids might even tell you to fuck off. But at the end of the day, on your last day on earth, you're going to be stuck with yourself. So if you didn't love yourself and do everything to optimize yourself and make yourself the best version of you possible, then you ultimately are to blame to, for that. Yeah. So, so don't succumb to that peer pressure and say, yeah, you know what? I am going to draw a line in the sand. I am going to take an hour and a half each day and I'm going to go work out. Or I'm going to take three days a week that I go engage in some type of martial art. I, I'm going to take uh, three hours mm. every weekend or every other weekend and I'm going to go out to the range and I'm going to sling lead on target because that makes me better able to protect myself, protect my family, protect those around me. That's not selfish. Yeah, I, I think... I think there was this this movement right and i could be wrong doc i could be wrong you tell me i think there was this movement for a little while that it was 
it wasn't being a real man taking care of yourself. And there's been, you know, jokes about that. Like I'm a huge fan of the be a man Instagram page. If you guys haven't <laughs> right. checked it out, he's like, be a man, go to, don't go to the hospital, die. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, he's, he's actually from my hometown too, really? which is hilarious. Not, not yeah. at all surprising. Yeah. <laughs> we're, both, <laughs> we're both from Boston. So I, I think for a long time, there was that movement. We're starting to come out of it because people are starting to understand anatomy, physiology. Guys are starting to understand how to take care of your body. When you get older, you don't need to go and pound weights like you used to. Things change. Your body evolves. Your diet. You don't have to succumb to the the usual pressures of you need to be this like you said diabetic fat you need to go to the drive through you know all those things uh uber eats is like the devil on everybody's shoulder like order me i'm easier yeah instead of having a good home cooked meal and i think keeping those fundamental regimens in our life whether it's a martial art whether it's the gym whether it's this self-care does have its benefits to everybody else in the equation and it's like you know you, we all say this in circles if we don't get to the gym or we don't do something that we get that physical energy out it just builds up inside you and where you're going to put it right it's mm -hmm. like it's like anything else so you become like a combustible uh creature sometimes especially if you're a regimented guy you need a place to put that uh I think it's totally a, a tremendous message. There's also what I think a second theme in there, and I think there's a third that I uncovered. The second being not just about being more capable, but the reinvention, which you talked about, and how to reinvent yourself properly through through good things, not necessarily being like, you know, I'm old and I have to take these painkillers, and my reinvention is I'm going to sit on the couch, take a bunch of painkillers, and just sit here. And you have every right to do that because you've been through everything. How the question I have in reading some of the the book eggs is 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 how do you mentally as a veteran as a as a as a leader as a doctor how do you blow through that barrier of you know I just want to slip into old age you know how do you what's the wh what's the mental conditioning you know everybody has a different way like I think it was Pat McNamara said I just looked at my shoes by the edge of my bed and my sneakers and one day I just put them on and I started training again you know and I got that love for training but how do you mentally blow through that because it is very easily to succumb to that and I don't know that we'll find the answer yeah, I, and I, don't, I think the answer is different for mm. a lot. You know, if you ask 100 different people, you get 100 different answers. If you ask, and I'll, I'll take that even a step farther, if you have to 100, ask 100 successful people, you get 100 different answers. Yeah. And then if you ask 100 people that are maybe living the lifestyle we're talking about we, that you shouldn't live, you'd get 100 of their answers, right? So everybody's going to have a slightly different perspective on that. But I think at, the, at its core, it's recognizing that no matter, at no matter what age, you're going to choose your hard Right? Mm. You hear that? You hear that a lot. You hear "choose mm. your heart." I'll tell you about a friend of mine, uh, John Colker, uh, total cardiac arrest survivor. Had a massive, had a widow, widow maker myocardial infarction yeah. years ago. Now he's a triathlete, and he has hiked the Appalachian Trail. Wow! Right? So, right, the heart that he chose before. So before he was eating what he wanted. He was smoking, you know, he was not, not taking care of himself, yep. not really exercising. So the hard that he chose was being clinically dead for a few minutes and then being in a coma, uh, a medically induced coma for a few days, getting heart stents and coming out of that. The hard that he's chosen now in reaction to that is I, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to eat right. Uh, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to, I'm going to, Put myself to the to the put myself to the hazard, as they say, and push the envelope mm. because success is on the other side of hard work. Health is on the other side of hard work, and we know that mental health and physical health go so closely hand in hand. And I don't think we give that enough enough credence as, no. to, as to how intertwined that is. Mm. You know, uh, do that, now do you meet professional athletes at the peak of their game who are, are mentally just a dumpster, psychologically just a dumpster oh. fire? Absolutely you do. Do you meet people that are mentally and psychologically and emotionally in a good place, um, but they're, they need a scooter when they go to Walmart? Absolutely you do. But those are the outliers. I think, mm. for, you know, for the most part, you talked about it's, as a stress reliever, as a coping mechanism, yeah. right? Uh, all the optimization that goes on in your body, whether we're talking about uh, circulation, hormone release, um, your sleep patterns, uh, your blood sugar, all of that contributes to mental, psychological, even spiritual wellness. Mm. So if you want all that, you have to balance it. Yeah. And, and you have to have an eye to that each and every day when you get up, that today I'm going to be 
uh, a slightly version, slightly better version of myself today mm. than I was yesterday. This week is going to be a little bit better than the week before. And there might be weeks that you you go back a little bit. You know, I'm 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 drinking a, a monster beverage and I had a donut today, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you have this wonderful donut sponsor that I just couldn't pink pass box. Out. Pink box. Go get one. <laughs> so good you lick the box. <laughs> I, I can I can believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna you know I'm gonna make up for that next week, and I know that. And this isn't that's not a lifestyle. It's a it's an, an indulgence in moderation. Yeah, and you have to allow yourself that, I think. And I think you, you earn do. it. I yeah. think you earn it. Like, you earn that steak dinner. It's funny. <laughs> I was out with Bo Sandoval not long ago, the UFC S&C coach, and we were talking, and he, as he's talking to me about health and nutrition, he's eating a steak soaked in butter. But that's, you know, I think it's, uh, you're right, it's about balance. And at the core of the message, you get into some of that. And I, I picked up on those themes, and, and they really hit home. And you do it so concise in the book. And if you guys check it out, I'll hold it up here. Uh, it, it's a great read, and it's quick, and it's painless. I haven't got all the way through, but it comes, you know, endorsed by Tim Kennedy, and, a, and of course, uh, Chael is on here. But just really great themes and takeaways. And, like, what I enjoyed the most is you say what works for you and what's worked for you, and you're not afraid to show, hey, listen, you know, these these – bullet points or these takeaways or these I, everybody has a term these arrows in the quiver or right. whatever it is tools in the <laughs> toolbox they may work for you they may not but this is what what i had success moving forward and that allows me to move through the book and through the chapters and i enjoyed that and there's always one that hits home in every chapter so yeah. i i think it was really well thought out well written one of the better books probably more people should be reading especially more guys out there and, and and even some women i think there's a place for that and i think the theme of it all is just to become a more capable person and become a more capable human at any age yeah 40 i think even saying over 40 over 50 over 60 yeah. and i think that there's a lot that the human body and, and tom brady's proven that every week that the human body can do week in and week out does it it obviously doesn't shock you what he's capable of doing tom brady can do that mm -hmm. yeah like like the saying goes in ted tom yeah. brady could do that yeah he could <laughs> and i i think you really hit home with it now there's a big place for that whole i want to be a real man movement mm -hmm. and i don't get a lot of those overtones in this i get almost like a workbook approach of how to do this and that's what i think makes it better and that's what i think makes it a, a really high quality read so to anybody out there that gets a chance go check it out it's a great book and i i think as we get to know mike a little bit more in this podcast doc really brings home a lot of these themes and i i took awesome pleasure in, in reading some of the, the thoughts you had just on taking care of the body and human performance, but that's geek stuff to some folks. Right. Really, the, the idea of being able to reinvent yourself is something that will hit home with a lot of folks. And I had somebody tell me this once, and I want to get your thoughts. You'll reinvent yourself three times in life. I'd say at least three times. I think three times is probably yeah. the average, and that's for people who aren't even really paying attention. Um, me, a good point. I've got a little touch of ADHD, and so I've reinvented, you know, I went, I went into the army in 1984 Jeez. and I had, uh, it's a whole different world. One, man. two, three, four. I had five, five different MOSs, five different jobs in the military, you know, kind of for just that reason, because yeah. I was constantly reinventing. And now really I'm on my sixth because, you know, even though, uh, I retired from the military as a physician, I didn't retire with the, I was an EM physician. So I was going to work in an ER until I mm -hmm. retired. And now I have a podcast and I'm writing books and I, I have my own supplement company. So I've kind of reinvented myself yeah. again. Uh, and that's not counting what I did, you know, in reality television with the History Channel. So yeah. six or seven times for me, because I'm a, a little bit of an outlier. I'm a little bit scatterbrained and I chase shiny objects. But I think <laughs> everybody re reinvents himself at least three yeah, times. Yeah, at least three times. Least. A, a, a wise man once told me that. He said, you'll reinvent yourself three times in life. And that doesn't mean, guys, you're on the run from the law. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's not WinSec. <laughs> no, it's not like, <laughs> Yeah, if it gets to that. Yeah. But you, you will reinvent yourself. And that might include, you know, maybe you left a bad marriage. Maybe you went into a new situation, a, a new job. It, it, maybe it's you are fat and you're trying to get in shape in that journey you're going to go through so many of those journeys in life but there'll be three main reinventions and i tend to agree with that theory and, and i and i buy into that and i think you you the undertone of the book touches on a lot of that as you go through like like listen if if you're good at this go forward go towards it and embrace it 
Yeah. You know, I, I get a kid. I've had Chef Rush on. He's an interesting one, too. He was in the military, but just loved, had a passion for cooking mm -hmm. and got into cooking. And I think there's a lot of guys out there that develop a passion for something. And the hard part is when is it not a hobby and when is it a career? Mm -hmm. That's where it can be difficult, right? And finding your identity in that career. And I always say you have to find a way to monetize what you love. Yeah. It, and it's funny you say that because that's actually the, that is a theme in the first book that I started to write that I haven't gotten published yet. See? Is, Unauthorized documents being released yeah, here live so, on the show. <laughs> what I call it is most people are living their plan B, mm. right? Because your plan A, you were a junior in high school and you wanted to be an athlete or you wanted to be, I don't know, a race car driver or an actor. You had something that you just love doing, that it was never, you could do it all it day didn't long. didn't pay you. Yeah, yeah, and it would never be work, right? That in an ideal world would have been your plan A, right? Mm -hmm. So when you, like when you hear people talk about, oh, if we had universal basic income, everybody could do that. Well, that's not exactly true, but uh, that's a whole other show. We but could get to that later. We, I am kind of a yeah. fan of, of UBI. But. <laughs> yeah. but most people <laughs> end up living their plan B, right? They're, they're going to, they're they're getting on the train every day. The cubicle. Going to work the cubicle, right? That's plan B. And I like to tell people, hey, you got plan B down. Plan B is paying the bills. Don't abandon plan B, right? You, you, a safety net is great, but maybe start exploring plan A again. Mm. Like you say, how do you, we, it's 2021 for God's sakes. You can monetize literally almost anything. I say it all the time to brands, Doc, and to, to, to folks all the time. There's a kid somewhere on YouTube opening presents making $17 million a year. There you go. You know, so yeah. you can pretty much monetize, at this point, taking a shit. Right. I mean, <laughs> it, it, you really can. And Ryan Kennel asked a really good question. I know Ryan personally. He's been on the show. He said he just separated from the Navy after 11 years, and this conversation is really resonating with him. And I think there's a lot of guys like that, you know, whether they're uh, a year or two removed from separation or a year or two away. This is going to hit really home with them and they try to figure out whether you were 20 years in law enforcement or in the military or you had this this great structure the machine around you mm -hmm. it's the what now okay yeah and i think some guys have a picture of that but it's the leap of faith that scares them and i think a lot of times they have to put themselves back in the mindset of the leap of faith that they took to sign the papers to sign them you know to join the military or law enforcement or anything in between any formal you know, place, but that's a leap of faith, but we disregard it because we're young and we feel like we can take chances. You know, we feel mm -hmm. a little looser when you get older, you feel like you can't take those chances, but are they really chances? If you have the 10,000 hours, you have the time in, you understand the space. I'm not saying everybody should go out and be a race car driver or 50, but at right. the same time, you should not be afraid to push into those things. And if you enjoy them and you maybe can kind of find a way to monetize them, but maybe not really. Is it a hobby if it's helping you build your personal brand or is it still a business? I think it's still a business. And I think that there's a place you can grow and it may lead to a book. It may lead to other things. Yeah. It just really depends. And I think everybody's different. And I think it's going to it's gonna hit home with everybody differently. And we talked about this offline. Everybody's going to have a different trigger that's going to get them out of bed. And you hope that it's not the heart attack. Right. You know, that's always the hope, right? I had some heart issues, so the heart stuff really hits home for me. Now, some stuff, some physical capabilities, they're unavoidable. They will happen. There's no two ways about it. It's what you do after. It's like people always says, it's your reaction to things that dictates how they go. Right. You know, and I think that's something that I wish more people would understand. I wish I knew at a younger age, to be quite honest. Uh, if you could go and tell your younger self something, what would it be? So I, I always answer this the same. Yeah. <laughs> and this will open up a whole other thing. Like that maybe would result in this book not even being written. So, so, the, so the, the question, you know, the, I, for some reason, this is one of those really pop, popular come up on your Facebook sure. feed. Uh, you, you encounter yourself from at age 18. You can only say three words. What do you say? Oh, that's a hard one. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. <laughs> because I discovered it so late in life. You know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm 55 years old. It wasn't even a thing on the scene, right? Yeah. Until the nineties. Oh, 15 years ago right? at least. So, yeah. So it was like, what is this thing? You know, I wish I would have known about it at an earlier age, but it's this whole two edged sword thing because, yeah. you know, I'm a firm believer. And if you're happy where you are, I'm exceedingly happy where I am in my life right now. So, you know, the butterfly effect, if I go back in time and change one thing, I might not be here. And I'm a firm believer in that. I also think 
there is something to be said for the fact that I discovered jujitsu late in life because I don't have high, high sta- unlimited stamina and mm. strength and easy recovery to fall back on. It has changed the, the way that I have had to approach learning jujitsu. And I think in the end, I think that's a good thing for me. I would agree. I think the biggest takeaway from jujitsu when you're older, and I, I, I got, I didn't get into it when I, when the wheels totally came off. I still got a little dance in the step, but I found that if you understand that as you get older, athleticism wanes Mm -hmm. and technique needs to go up Mm -hmm. and you apply that to everything else in life, you just have to have better techniques in how you approach things. And that includes getting your gear ready for the range, Mm -hmm. training, anything. And as you layer on life's uh, um, little mysteries, whether it's children, a marriage, or this or that, all these different things, the preparation becomes that much more important. When you're young, you could throw anything in a bag and run out the door. Mm-hmm. When you get older, you have to be prepared. You have to put your thoughts into the bag. You have to put, you know, you start your day differently and you go through a different approach. And I feel like as a man, you don't start to learn that till you're in your mid to late thirties. Then it starts to click. I go to the 6 a.m. class of jujitsu. I notice all the 7 PMers that realize there's no more gas left in the tank to compete and they're not going to be in the UFC and they're not going to, they start showing up at the 6 AM because I've been going to it for years. They slowly start to filter into the 6 AM because they still want it to be a part of their life, but they're Mm -hmm. realizing that it's not going to be the main piece. Right. So I think the hard thing for some folks, and I want to get your thoughts on this is when do you realize to put something down? Because that's important too and begin to pick something else up that mm-hmm. might make sense for you at this point in your life because there are going to be those things along the way what do you put down to pick up jujitsu do you still do weights do you still put do are you capable of doing all these things how do you juggle all the different tony robbins type things in your life what mm-hmm. fits in i don't think we have an answer for that but i think you have to know when to put things down too you know, when you're a, when you're a child, you play with childish things. When you're an right. adult, you put childish things away. Well, you, you hit on a really a it's really a tough one. You put you hit on something really key that I talk about in the book, and it's uh, I I had to resist the urge when I wrote the book to steal the line from uh, Shanghai Noon. Yeah, where uh, Owen Wilson says to his gang, "You lost your wing in it privileges." Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to wing it. Okay, you guys have lost your wing in it privileges. Yes. When you get older, you lose your wing in it privileges, mm-hmm. right? Like you said, uh, there was a time in my uh, in my 20s where I would get up, lace up my running shoes, walk outside, and start to stretch with no idea what I was going to do. I would start to run sometimes, <laughs> not knowing, is this, where gonna, I was going. is this three, is this eight? Like, I don't know. Is this a Farklick rung? Is this, is this, in a, in a, am I doing sprints somewhere in here? Am I going to stop in the middle of the <laughs> I know woods? the feeling, yeah. Find a tree and do some pull-ups on a branch? I, I don't know. I was winging it, right? And when you get older, you can't do that. You really do need to have a plan. And it's because your body's not as resilient, so your recovery is different. Yes. That's probably the biggest reason, right? You, it also, it's harder to warm up your body. You've got some injuries that you brought to the table. And you talked about knowing when you're going to lay something down. Mm. I think if something gives you pleasure, you don't ever have to lay it down, but you do have to modify it. You have to modify your approach to it. And uh, the example that you gave, you know, are we doing strength and conditioning? Are we doing jujitsu? Mm. There was a time when when I was first getting out of the military, actually it started kind of right before, that I thought, well, I'm just going to get all of my fitness from jujitsu and from boxing, and that's it. I'm not going to do anything else. And I was hurt all the time. Yeah, I was hurt all the time. And the problem was, and I illustrate this in the book, is a lot of the stabilization muscles were getting neglected, right? So, you know, posturally I was having issues, joint stability I was having issues, connective tissue was Mm. a problem. So I was injured all the time. So I do, now, I do uh, four days a week, serious uh, strength and conditioning, and then I do jujitsu two to four times a week, mm. kind of depending. I did a little experiment a few weeks ago. I wanted to see how it would go, where five days in a row, I grappled every day, and I did strength and conditioning every day. And that kicked my ass. Yeah. By, by Friday, because uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays were, I, were the worst days, because that was grapple early strength and conditioning. You need an ice bath. By yeah, it was, it was pretty awful. So I went to, you know, Friday, I went to a Danaher class. I went home. 
And I was like, I don't know if I can go to the gym this afternoon. And that's mentally draining too. Yeah, but the problem was, is I was doing it as an online challenge for everybody mm -hmm. to see. And I'm like, I, you know, I can't. Can't say I, no. I'm going to lose my man card if I don't go do this, right? right? So I had to go and do it. And, I, and it took me a couple of days to recover afterwards. So now I know what's too much, mm. right? And, and I'm titrating back a little bit. Um, but again, you just got to be smart about it. And Yeah, and I think it's where to start too. To a lot of guys out there, and I know we're, we're – we're probably talking at a not a not an advanced level, but you got to understand where to start, too, guys. And I say this all the time. People ask me constantly, John. I want to go to the gym. I'm like, start with a regimen you can keep, whether it's one day a week, whether it's two days a week. Mm -hmm. Stay in a regimen you can maintain, and if you can maintain that for six or eight weeks, then you can look at layering more on. Whether it's going from two jujitsu classes, I always say, if you want to excel at something, especially like a jujitsu, you need two to three days a week mm -hmm. if you want to learn and you want to be able to perform on a certain level. If it's just a hobby, one day a week's fine. Right. If you're not a big weightlifter at this point in my life, like I don't need to go to the gym and pound weights like I did when I was 25. I'm I'm going to probably be a pretty strong guy for a while. I go three days a week. I lift weights. I'm happy with that. That's all I feel I need. And I can stay limber and move around. But it's about having a system in place that works for you and beating that system to death. Yeah. And working it. Yeah. And, and you hit on a really key point, which is you have to start when you have to start your plan around what, what you can, you can do and yeah. what you can maintain. Because too often people say, OK, I'm going to get in shape or whatever. <laughs> Right, which is a very, very vague term. Dangerous one. Yeah. So the first one of the first things you have to identify is, okay, realistically, how many days a week do I have and how much time during those days do I have? So I call this it's it's the burrito theory. Yeah. So I'm gonna make a burrito. So the first thing I need to know if I'm gonna make a burrito is how big my tortilla is. Of course. Right? Do I have a big chipotle sized tortilla? Of or do I have a little street taco sized tortilla? Because that limits what you can put in it, right? So if your schedule is a little street taco-sized tortilla, don't <laughs> think that you're going to have three scoops of a brisket going in that burrito because that's just not going to happen. Right. Right. So identify this. You know, yeah, you got at the same time you're identifying how much time you have. You're also identifying well, what am I working out for? What are my fitness goals? How right. am I going to measure this? Mm -hmm. Right. Not I'm going to be in better shape. Well, what does that mean to you? Does mm -hmm. it mean your squat and deadlift max are going to go from X to Y. Mm -hmm. Does that mean your your body weight is going to go from whatever it is now to whatever different weight? You know, maybe that's losing weight. Maybe that's gaining weight because you want to put on muscle. Do you want to run faster? Is there some type of endurance event? Is there a certain AMRAP that you want to do to evaluate yourself now and then do it again in six months and, you know, shave two to three minutes off that time? What is it? You know, you, right. you need to have goals. And the other thing is, and this is uh, Jeffro Mullinex, who's a friend of mine. He texted me this morning, as a matter of fact. So he's probably watching. Jeffro, what's up? He, <laughs> he always says, you can't manage what you don't measure. That's a great line. Isn't that a great line? Yeah. yeah. You can't manage what you don't measure. Yeah. I like that. And and I, I think you're right. I think it's about finding out what your goals are at this stage of the game and i think as a man when you're over 35 and you start to creep into 40 you start to feel like okay you start to plan more strategically yep. like you said it's not flying by the seat of your pants it's not let me you throw the sneakers in a bag it's it's purpose driven and i think the closer you can get to purpose driven the better off you'll be and i think the mistake some guys make and everybody out there that listens to this whether you're separating from the military, law enforcement, years of structure, of something that drove structure into your life and you're creating your own structure, think with the end in mind. What are you trying to accomplish? What is the B and C you have to get through to get to D? And understand what those things are. And it's a great book for that. And the themes all speak about that. And I, I, I think it's at the core of, of who you are, too. And I think people have to understand, you don't have to go out there and be, you know, a world-class runner or a world-class jujitsu. You know, if it's a hobby, understand. I always tell people this. I always say, my brain is like The Shining. I have these boxes, right, <laughs> that I put things in. And for me, everything fits in a box. Some get a padlock. Mm -hmm. Some get a combination lock, some get a biomechanic lock, and I can open them very easily. Some I don't ever want to open them at all, and I don't ever want to go back there. I have no desire to power lift ever again in my, in my life. There's no place for it for me at the stage of the game that I'm at. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy explosive movements, and I don't incorporate those into my training. I incorporate them differently now. It's like Bob Obris famously said on, on Rogan's podcast, people who do deadlifts for deadlift's sake are idiots. 
you know, and I agree with him. And I've said it for years to my friends in the weightlifting community. If you're not competing, what the fuck are you doing deadlifts for? Because the risk to return ratio isn't there yeah. to me. There was a social media firestorm. I remember that. I know. Statement. I know. And what was funny was I was listening to that driving home from having done deadlift that day. But people don't understand who he was talking to. That's yes, the thing. That's the, yeah, that's the problem is, is they, they took that totally out of con in the context in which he operates and in which he was describing in that conversation, he was 100% correct. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't saying everyone on the, this planet who is deadlifting is wasting yep. their time. That's not what he was yep. saying. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and I think sometimes people don't understand that. What what you start with isn't what you finish with. The circle you started with isn't the circle you finish with. I understand in a perfect world, everybody wants to say, this is my friend since high school. It doesn't work that way. Right. You evolve, life evolves, and a lot of things are going to be thrown at you. And the pieces that you need... God has a funny way of putting them in your life when you need them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jiu-jitsu, something like that. The structure of those things. Am I going to need those things at 50? Uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know what that will look like. I know at 40 I did mm -hmm. and I enjoy the camaraderie and, and you pull different things out of things. It's funny. I was sitting with one of my coaches and I said to him, I said, I just enjoy coming to jujitsu. Can that be good enough? And he goes, yeah. I yeah. said, so Stop trying to teach me jujitsu. Yeah. I just want to come and enjoy jujitsu. Yeah. And there's a place it's, for that. It's, it's like that meme. It's yeah. a peaceful life. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it's okay to enjoy some things for enjoying them's sake. And you don't have to take some worldly takeaway from it. And to everybody out there, if you find a passion, something you enjoy, even if it's a leisurely thing, enjoy the shit out of it. Yeah. And make it a part of your life. And if it makes you happy, who the hell are we to judge? Well, and you know, and I early on, like I bagged on on golf. You know, because it's mm. kind of a stereotype. But uh, there was a time in my life where I played golf and I enjoyed playing golf. And of if course. you're somebody who, play, who enjoys golf, uh, far be it for me. I'm not going to tell you. I have close friends that love to play golf. And they're like, when are you going to come out and shoot 18 with me? I'm like, never. I'm yeah. like, I'll, I'll, I'll ride the card for I'll caddy for you. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll hang out for you. With, I agree with, with you the on day. the golf thing. But it's just, it's just not my thing anymore. It's not my jam. Yeah. I agree with you on the yeah. golf thing. I, I, I liked golf. I golfed in high school. It was a great way to get out of class. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I had a lot of fun doing it probably straight through college. Now, I can't go near a course. I feel like it's a waste of my time. I'm like, this is a total waste. It's just an all-day thing, man. That's, that's and, thing. And it And it's the, so this is going to go deeper. It's the people it attracts to. Like, I just don't <laughs> want to walk around and drink drinks and wear a sweater I'm never going to wear again. Right. It's just not, yeah. it's not me. You know, I don't want to put silks on. I'm sorry. Uh, we were joking the other day, too, on the jiu-jitsu mat. Coach Casey said, he goes, you know, it's like those guys that wear the, the silk karate pants. <laughs> it's like, you know, and that's, it's understanding, you know, where pieces fit in your life. And it doesn't mean to say I wouldn't go back to it later, but yeah i mean golf is one of those things i feel like it just it's a waste of time right now i know people will be upset listening but if you golf and you enjoy it go do it golf courses are a waste of really good gun ranges I mean, oh yeah there's some that are incorporating it yeah well mm -hmm. hey there you go that's the way to go yeah go shoot skeet and trap or something yeah. now as a doctor i want to get into the weeds a little bit okay and as a guy that's out there seeing what's going on in the world today, does it drive you nuts it has to right yeah so uh where do you begin? Yeah, that's that was going to be my next question is where, <laughs> like, li just the rhetoric got to drive you nuts. Just, just if there's a blanket. Yes, <sighs> like no matter what medical topic we're talking about, whether whether you were referring to the pandemic or not, the answer is just yes. Like it all just frustrates the rise the of the WebMD. Yeah, so it's I used to I so way back. God, this might have been so long ago. It might have been like MySpace days. <laughs> I, I I I posted something that I said. And this was before there was such a thing, or, or we didn't know what a meme was. But I, but I posted something, and I said, I had a dream. I was on a flight, and the guy next to me said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a doctor. And he said, oh, I'm the guy that invented WebMD. And then, and then it said, dot, dot, dot. As security removed me from his bloodied corpse. <laughs> <laughs> because WebMD, it just anybody in medicine, it just makes you cringe. Cringe. Because it's like, you know, they come in and it's, it's so bad. It, here's it's a funny story. Uh, I had some problems with my Jeep and a certain series of lights came on. Mm. So I Googled it, right? And I found like a, a Reddit forum where they're talking about, and it's like, oh, it's your cam sensor. So I go into my Jeep dealer and they know me there. I've been going there yeah, for yeah. years and they know that I'm a doctor. And I said, look, man, 
I hate it when people look up their symptoms online, but I looked it up online and it says it's my cam sensor. I'm like, I just had to get that out there. I, feel free to do make, what you want. Yeah, feel yeah. free to make fun of me if you want. And he comes back like 10 minutes later. He's like, it's your cam sensor. Sure. And I go, you really shouldn't have told me that. Like you should have just flat out yeah, lied, lied to me because now you're reinforcing this behavior. Yeah. Right? And I don't like to reinforce that behavior in my patients. And the problem is, is there's so there's, there's a ton of bad information out there. There's, uh, and with anything, you know, like WebMD is a prime example, is the people only read, they don't read that whole paragraph. They, the parts that are scariest jump out at them <sighs> and they run to the emergency room typically, mm -hmm. right? It's like uh, nurse advice lines. We have nurse advice lines all over the country and they generally don't do any good because somebody calls, you call the nurse advice line and you mm. say, oh, I've got this going on. And they say, well, you know, it's probably, you know, based on this, you don't have a fever and you're not having any difficulty breathing, blah, blah, blah. Based on that, it's probably just this. You can try these home remedies and you can wait a few days. But, but if you're concerned, you can go, you can always go to the emergency room. And they're required to say that, right? Because mm. they don't want to give bad advice and then somebody died. Yeah. 99 people out of 100, all they hear is blah, 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 go to the emergency room. And then they come to me and they say, I called the nurse advice line. They told me to come to the emergency room. And it's like, well, that's, that's the part you heard. Yeah. That's not actually what they said, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of the the internet has has been Tower of Babel. Yeah, the Tower of Babel when it comes mm. to medical disinformation and misinformation, and there are people out there. Um, there's a doctor uh, in the Northeast who's who financed his uh, his beach house on fucking snake oil, and I don't want to get sued, so I'm not going to mention his sure. name. Sure, um, we can talk about that offline, but uh, and there's more than one. Yeah, and, and there's and a lot the, of them. And there's a lot of them that are just, they want, uh, they want some time in the spotlight. So they're like, well, what can I say that people really want to hear and feed into either this group over here or this group over here, because that's what they really want to hear. So I'm going to really be a champion of that echo chamber. And subsequently, I'm going to get a social media following and I'll get invited on some talk shows and maybe I'll get a book out of it and maybe I'll be a guest a frequent uh, guest as a medical expert yeah. on some news news channel, and that's what they want out of this. Yeah, right? and uh, it's uh, it's hard to watch. It's, they want to be yeah, amplified. They want to be amplified. You know, they want they want their fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think Fauci should resign? Uh, I do think Fauci should re to to get right to the meat and potatoes of it without anything in between. Yes, I think Fauci should resign, and I think the reason. It, I think he's compromised. As a doctor, yeah. I think he's compromised. That's why I think he should resign. So uh, early on in this whole pandemic, right, uh, I even did an episode of my podcast, and it was called Just Wear the Damn Mask. Yeah. Because this was early on, and intuitively, n not knowing what we didn't know early it on. It made some sense. It made sense. Yeah. And the Precautions. And, and two weeks to flatten the curve, you're like, you know what? From an epidemiological standpoint. Makes sense. It makes sense. Right, less people interacting means you know less, less transmission. It makes sense. Now, I've gone back and done episodes of my podcast later where I said, "Hey, I w it's not that I was wrong when I said that based on the information that I had. That was what was know, available. Yeah, I was saying what was available. Now, knowing what I know now, I don't. I would never make you know, and I've never made a big deal out of it. Like people should lose their livelihoods or you know, right. you know, not be permitted. But you know, my whole take on it was, hey, if you go to a business, you go to a restaurant, and they want you to mask, hey, they want, they also want you to wear pants. If you don't want to do either one of those things, <laughs> then go home and call Uber Eats, right? <laughs> and, and you know, don't make a scene and don't video yourself making a scene, and uh, you know, and pretend like you are, uh, you know, a prophet. Because, <laughs> because uh, you know, you're standing up to the man and you didn't wear the mask. You know, it's like, wh wear it if they ask you to. They're a business. They have a right to ask you to. Uh, but I don't, all this mandates, you know, that's why I'm glad I live in Texas. You know, we, yeah. we struck down a lot of the mandates. And it, it lets people make their own decisions, you know. Yeah, I think I, my issue with a, with a lot of this has changed okay and and i i hate getting into this should you get the vaccine should you not get it like you said that's a separate podcast the, mm -hmm. the, that's getting in the weeds i agree with the mandates but the bigger issue i have here and i think this speaks to even 
discussions as men, you have a very weak administration. Okay. You have mm-hmm. a very weak and crippled administration, not just physically in it's in, in Biden, but across the board. And the problem is his inability to lead effectively and be an effective leader has compromised the whole situation Mm -hmm. because what people don't don't realize on the outside how politics really works is they smell blood in the water and everybody's scrambling to get their time everybody's scrambling to get their their 20 minutes you got fauci over here with his agenda you got kamala with her agenda and her bullshit you know media stuff trying to position her as the next you know kingmaker you have biden who doesn't know what the fuck's going on he's just getting pulled into rooms and you gotta sit here sir and read this he has no idea he's not writing his own copy he's not even involved in it you could tell by the way he's reading it he's allegedly allegedly pooping his pants at the vatican yeah there's a lot of that that but when you you see that week of an administration it becomes a free-for-all and i think what's gone on and the american people everybody needs to understand this i think fauci and 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 all the other uh carrot danglers have realized they have this enormous power and it's a great chance for them to get a book deal to do Mm -hmm. people don't understand how it really works at those levels they're just trying to get national time get a book deal get notoriety develop their own brand develop their name and then they want to parachute out the ones that stay too long the nancy pelosi's the fight the problem is that never ends well right in politics it's never ended well and that's why i say knowing when to let go of some things nancy pelosi could have retired five Five years ago and went down as like this great lawmaker and all this shit she's killing her legacy destroying mm-hmm. california whatever legacy that was there and biden it's the same thing it's like watching a sad clown mm-hmm. and he's at like 30 percent within his own party fauci is enormously disliked you know across the spectrum mm-hmm. everybody's listening to what he says as blind science it's not accurate okay Mm -hmm. and one week it's wear the mask the next week it's don't it's wear it for theater and it's being proven now in florida and texas and they hate this data coming out doc Mm -hmm. that it's disproving a lot of these things because not that in the beginning you were wrong you were right in what you said and i would have agreed with you at the time but we did it yeah and how do we move on and the problem is these guys don't want to let go of the branch they have yeah. they're monkeys yeah until they have the next topic and now the next thing interestingly enough that candace was bringing up was these power outages mm-hmm. that are going to be the next big thing we'll cut your power to get you to do what we want or to clean up the message whatever that is mm-hmm. i think it's tremendously dangerous and i've said for a while this isn't me this is a jordan peterson philosophy but i want to say it The left has an incredibly hard time putting people in boxes and understanding, okay, what we say on the right sometimes is that's a racist. We don't want to fuck with them. We're going to put them over there. The left doesn't have the ability to do that. They want to pass $5 trillion in bills. Who's paying for it? Mm -hmm. Who's paying for it? They're talking about $450,000 in reparations. They don't give soldiers that when they come back dead. Yeah. It's crazy, doc. No, it's nuts. It's, it's nuts. Yeah, it's it, it, it's twenty twenty one is an is an absolute uh, political and societal dumpster fire, and we're we're watching it Play unfold. Out. And it's like you couldn't write if you wrote this as a reality show ten years ago, nobody would have fucking bought it because mm-hmm. they're like none of that's believable. No way. <laughs> but I think part of the problem, and I wanted to ask you this. I I encountered a guy the other day. I had to go film a commercial for a friend locally. And they just needed people to sit in the crowd. It was just kind of B-roll. So don't anybody out there, I wasn't filming a Nike commercial. But, uh, you know, just helping a friend out, a sponsor, Pink Box. I'll tell this, Pink Box was filming a commercial. But they had a guy there that was like the mask police. Mm -hmm. He wasn't employed by by any of the businesses or anything. But I'm sitting there, and and you know what he had the balls to say to me? And this is what gets under my skin. He goes, this job's a lot harder to do in Texas than it is here. And I looked at him, and I go, you motherfucker. I'm like, why do you think it would be easier here? We allow some of these things to happen, dog. Mm-hmm. And what has to start happening is people not, you don't have to, I'm not Maxine Waters. I'm not saying get in people's face or anything. But what you have to say is you're a piece of shit for even taking the job. Mm-hmm. Okay. You should have said no. Okay. Because pushing these things, wear a mask. So you walk from one point in the restaurant to one other point to only take it off 
makes no sense medically or even societally makes no sense it's like saying dogs are allowed but you got to pick your dog up when you walk from the maitre d's desk <laughs> to the thing it makes no sense doc i mean yeah. it's and we allow it and do you think there's something to be said for us allowing it as a society yeah i i do think there and it's hard for me to wrap my mind around because you know a it's lot. Like, what do you do? Yeah, and a lot. You know, a lot of the people early on are. Uh, this is just a test to see what you're willing to go along with. I don't. I don't think. I don't think this. The inception of this was some bizarre conspiracy theory. Mm. To okay, we're going to do a, a big societal experiment where we see if we can convince them to wear masks, and then that's going to let us know if we can do whatever mm -hmm. three years from now i i don't think that right it's it's like shapiro hope it's like shapiro says never ascribe uh as something as being evil when it's easier to assume it was just they're fucking idiots right yeah so i think it was i think it was just Akram's razor yeah i think it was just a, a, we made what some people thought was an educated decision right the, you know the masking thing early on I think the I think ego is the thing that stepped in because you mentioned Fauci and it's not just him. Is people don't want to admit, you know, I when I when I make mistakes, I go on back on my mm -hmm. podcast and I admit I made a mistake. I did a whole breakdown on uh, a study that showed hydroxychloroquine did not work. Okay, that study got exposed as having manufactured some of the data. I went back and I did an episode where I said, okay, this study is no good. Yeah, now, flawed data. Yeah, now I'm going to caveat this. And I, I did it on my show, and I'll caveat it here by saying we still don't have a study that, that shows that it does work, but the study that showed definitively that it did not is a flawed study. I'm admitting my mm. mistake. Fauci and all these people in government, it's not just unique to him, have shown a reluctance to go back later and say, you know, he's never come out and said, all right, early on when I said, don't go get masks, I was scared that we were going to run out. And mm. then, you know, and then... Not only did he not, then when mask data started to show, hey, maybe these masks aren't everything. Now, if everybody wore an N95, it would be. But since most people are wearing shitty cloth masks, since most since people are wearing neck gaiters, since they're not wearing them properly, right? Then the masks aren't working. the 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 data when you compare Sweden and Germany is what showed that I think the most clearly. So rather than him admit that, he says, "Yeah, not only should you should wear a mask, you should fucking wear two. And it's like, nobody's going to try, you know, I, I've had multiple, you have too, had multiple leaders <sighs> in my, in my various careers that have made mistakes and then come back around and say, I made a mistake. I fucking own that. Right. Now let's move forward. Right. I, 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 I fuck it. I fucked up. Yeah. Right? So a leader that can't come back and do that, that's, that shows narcissism, that shows an inability to admit your own mistakes. And if you don't admit your own mistakes, you, can, you cannot then improve and move on from there. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, you know, let me explain to everybody listening. The only way Fauci gets ousted, so you understand how politics works and how this all works, and I'm sure Doc will agree, is there's a guy behind him or a gal that wants to be him and get there 15 minutes until they fuck him. He's not going to be out. Right. Okay. Eventually that may come where they'll leak something or something will come out. That's how this works to everybody listening. Uh, he's going to stay in power because he's feeding everybody beneath him and taking care of them really well. But it's like anything else. It gets at those levels. It gets really cutthroat. I'm sure there's a junior person or someone on his team that's going to expose something at some point that will shake the fabric. But I think the weakness of the administration has bred this. And I agree with what you're saying. I think the weakness of the administration has allowed this to proliferate and become a tool. Mm -hmm. And what CNN and what a lot of the media markets did was they weaponized it. Mm -hmm. And it's only until the ratings collapse because nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me give you a clue. Nobody cares. Nobody cares if you're LGBTQ, XYP. Nobody cares if you're him, her, it. But you all want us to care. I love that you all identify as something i love that you choose to get the shot or not i and, and i'm sure doc you do too but they want us to care on a deeper level that people just don't care yeah you know and they're trying to force feed the caring down you why do the democrats want everybody to be racist why is racism the biggest thing because it's a safe charge topic that they can bring up and be relevant yeah because they have to stay relevant they have to sell books they have to make appearances they have to do all these things just like you're discussing and to everybody out there listening that's how it works 
everybody's fighting for their CNN time or their Fox News time so they can push their next thing. That's all it is at those levels. And until somebody wants to fuck Fauci, I mean, you know, and you see it too. I mean, you've been in the medical profession. We all know that this is just, you know, uh, let's, let's see what we can throw up there at the crowd today, you know, kind of thing. Like, you know, and it's a shame. It's a shame that it's dumbed down to that, but that's what it's becoming. And I think the weakness of the administration put the blood in the water, yeah. Doc. I think that's what's causing it. Did you, I'm going to ask you a question yeah, that I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, but you might surprise me. Did you get vaccinated? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was very open about it. Uh, a few people have asked me. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I, uh, which which same, one did you get? Uh, I believe it was, I have to double check. Uh, it was the Johnson & Johnson. If I recall, you got no. one and done, or you got two shots. A uh, Pfizer was what I got. I okay. ended up getting Pfizer. Yeah. Sorry, I, I got Moderna. I got yeah. Pfizer, and I was very open about it. And I'm going to tell everybody. I'll tell everybody why for the hundredth time because I did post about it. But uh, I'm a healthy guy. Mm -hmm. It had no bearing on me. I have guests in and out of here all the time. I had no problem getting it. I did my own research. As a healthy guy, I was willing to get the the shot. I had no knock on wood. I had no problems after. I had not a single issue. I didn't mind getting it. Um, and I did it willingly. I went by myself to Walgreens and I, and I got it. I'm not a big flu shock guy. I'm not a big any of that. Uh, I just looked at the data and I said, okay, I'm at an age. I, I host a podcast where people are in and out. I'm susceptible. I don't want to get sick. So I go down. Yeah. Now hearing people still getting sick and having the vaccination mm -hmm. that concerns me. Yeah. Obviously well, we can talk about that. Yeah. If you want. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I got, I got the Moderna shot. Mm -hmm. Everybody in my family did. Um, I looked at their phase three trial data very closely. I looked at what my risks were and recognizing that, you know, uh, aside from age, I really don't have a lot in the way of risk factors of com comorbidities mm -hmm. you know, in, in what most of the people, and this is a big thing that keeps getting brought up a lot. And it's absolutely true is when you look at the people that have died, comorbidity, comorbidity is high, but, yeah. I would also encourage everyone to realize that 60% of people in the U.S. have at least one of those one, comorbidities, yeah. right? So don't don't go, oh, it's all about, you know, guy, you know, sitting on, at his computer terminal somewhere, 70 pounds, 70 pounds overweight, smoking two packs a day. It's all about comorbidities. I'm not going to, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. okay, you got the comorbidities, dude. So don't, you know, don't yeah. put that aside. Um, I was, I wanted to get vaccinated myself for a number of reasons, you know, traveling, I don't want to give up jujitsu and I'm not going to roll with a mask on. Yeah. I want to be able, I want to be able to interact with people. Right. Uh, I want to go to courses where I'm interacting with people from out of state and out of country yeah. We're traveling all over. They're going through Heathrow airport, getting exposed to who knows what. Right. Yeah. So I didn't want to have to worry about that. So based on the science and my interpretation of the science, I got the vaccine. My family members got the vaccine. I've never been in favor of mandates because I do hundred percent. It, it, your body, your choice. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, I've had a number of people email me and message me and go, and it, it's, it, it really hits home when people say yeah. to me this, doc, you're the only doctor I trust. What do you, what, what do you advise? And I say, look, man, based on what you're telling me about you and your lifestyle, yeah. if I were in your shoes, yes, I would get it. I would get it. Right. Yeah. Um, at, just recently had a, a firefighter, in New York city. Right. Uh, probably going to lose his job if he doesn't get the vaccine he's had covid and i said hey man natural immunity is better we know natural immunity is 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 strong is, is stronger mm -hmm. right um somebody out there in the in the pool who hasn't had it yet i don't think they should roll the dice hey i'd rather have natural immunity well mm. you might also get natural icu time out of that right yeah. but since you have already had it absolutely they should be carving out a caveat for you i'm sorry they're not okay but you're asking me a medical question, not an administrative question. So on the medical basis of it, hey man, you want if you want to keep your I'm sorry to say this, but you're only a couple of years from retirement. There's very little, if not no, downside to you just going ahead and getting the shot. And but ultimately it's up to you. Yeah. I can tell you if I were in your position, I would get it. Take that for what it's worth. And he wrote me back very appreciative and he is gonna go ahead and get the shot. Um but yeah, um, the whole mandate thing, you know, it's if, terrifying. If, if you don't want somebody to do it, that a hundred percent is the right way to do it. And the messaging and this has been fucked from day one. Mm. Okay. The messaging on both sides, because way back operation warp speed, probably, uh, one of the, uh, the, the greatest medical Marvel of our lifetime, 
right? The fact that you could do that soup to nuts that quickly. There were people on the in the medical profession saying, I don't, I don't trust anything that comes out of a Trump administration. I'm absolutely not going to get it. There was a petition from physicians going around saying this. Then magically, after the election, they all fucking changed their tune. Yeah. Now they're all in favor of it. And I'm like, don't you understand, you know, your hypocrisy that you hated that man so much and you made such a big stink out of this. Nobody's going to take you seriously now. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it that, oh, we're, you know, that the day before the election, we're taking shortcuts. There's no way this is safe. The FDA is compromised. To the day after the election, vaccine, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everybody should get it. In fact, we should have mandates saying that you mm -hmm. should get it because you, herd immunity is more important than your freedom. Mm. You can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. um, scientifically, medically, I've looked at the data, you've looked at the data. Um, you're better off vaccinated than you are unvaccinated. And we can talk about breakthrough cases in just a second. If you're going to make the argument with me, you know, I've had old friends, old acquaintances, guys that I served with and friends on social media try to come at this mm. and shoot medical and scientific holes in the vaccine. I tell them, you're always going to lose that argument. So don't, and usually when I see the argument, I can see eight or nine flaws in it like right away. It's mm -hmm. like you're, you're trying to oversimplify something that's really not, you really can't oversimplify, right? Now, if you're going to have a legal argument I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. There is a legal argument. There's not a medical or scientific argument. So don't try to have that one. Let's have it as a human rights yes. slash legal argument. Yes. Okay. And would I still kind of prefer that you get vaccinated? Yeah. Am I still going to associate with you and be your friend and talk to you even if you don't? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Okay. Do I want you to lose your job? Yeah. Fuck no. I don't want you to lose your 100%. job. 100%. Right. Uh, we could have a whole separate if we're talking about people in healthcare because I had to get That's a whole lot another of, show. I got <laughs> to get a whole lot of vaccinations mm -hmm. that I didn't necessarily want to get right. Yeah, from working in healthcare, so that's not new to sure. us. Yeah. Right? but again, that whole whole different show. Let's talk about the breakthrough cases. So yeah, now there, we're seeing breakthrough cases, and that's to be expected. I mean, you don't get a hundred percent immunity with anything. Nothing. Right? Um, what we know from Israel, we've been looking at Israel as kind of the canary in the coal mine this whole sure. time, right? Because they reached herd immunity levels quicker. They're at like nine, a very high 90s now, which is surprising for Israel because believe it or not, there's a, there's a lot of anti-vaxxers in Israel. Sure. But, but when it came to this particular vaccine, they did very, very well. And it's in the high 90s. But when you look at their new cases, their new cases are only running, the, it's uh, right around 60% of their mm. new cases are the vaccinated. Now, let's say the vaccine did nothing. Let's say it was the equivalent of wearing a red T-shirt, right? And we gave 97% of the population red T-shirts, right? Then you would expect out of the new cases, 97% of the new cases would be wearing red T-shirts. Sure. But they're not. So we know it is preventative in getting it, probably preventive somewhat in spreading it. But more importantly, the people that have been vaccinated have a shorter course and an easier course. They're less likely to be hospitalized. If they are hospitalized, less likely to be on the ICU or have an oxygen requirement, okay? So I know even if I get it, I know there's still a chance that I get it. It's somewhat diminished by my, me being vaccinated. Right. But if I do get it, I'm probably gonna have an easier run of things because I already have some antibodies, right? And I've got some T cell memory and I've got some B cell memory. So my body's going to ramp that up a little bit sooner. So I'm going to have an easier go of it mm. than somebody who either didn't have, you know, uh, natural immunity or vaccination previously. So when people look at, you know, mm. oh, you know, oh, well, people that are vaxxed are getting it. So that shows it's worthless. Well, pump the brakes because yeah. it, it doesn't show that it's worthless. Right. And we kind of expect that. But again, fucked up messaging from day one, because what the two things that they fucked up on the messaging when it comes to the vaccine is they should have said vaccinate. Not, not vaccinate and then continue wearing a mask and continue doing all the pain in the ass shit you don't want to do. It should have been, hey, vaccinate and this this is our key to you yeah. know you not having to worry. You having peace of mind every day, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And they should have said, and oh by the way, we do expect some breakthrough crises, but they're going to have an easier go of it. And that's what they should be talking about. The messaging on, on all aspects of this pandemic have been wrong. Well, I mean, it, you know, I think we, we touched on it earlier. I think that was partly, Doc, because there was this, the, they need something to talk about. And that's what people don't understand. Yeah. They need something to talk about. CNN needs to run a ticker, a death toll of this or that. They need those pieces to talk about. 
And I think part of the problem in all of the... But you, but you notice the death ticker magically went away. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah, we'll cover that real quick. But yeah, yeah the, there's the, there has to be something to discuss. And at a national level, they get these talking points and they want to ram them down your throat. You touched on one earlier, which is the Trump administration was very pro warp speed. We're going to get this out there. We're going to get this in the people's hands. Mm -hmm. And that was at the time when, you know, I was very for it. I'm like, this mm -hmm. makes sense. We're going to get something out there that's going to make sense. But I always agreed with everybody's right to choose sure. and agreeing with the principles of what you said, being a healthy male, being someone who takes somewhat care of himself, trains regularly, travels, all the different things. Getting the vaccination made sense for me on a certain level. Now, with that being said, I never abandoned my right for, for someone to have the option of to figure out what they want to do or what makes sense for them. Comorbidities, everything withstanding, I think people should sit with their physician. I think they should make an educated decision on what makes sense for them. I don't prescribe to the, I, I talk to two of my friends that are very good doctors and I talk to a, a physician I work with regularly that sees me and we made the decision. I said, I'm going to go get it. I think it makes a lot of sense, just like you walked through. And I think everybody has to kind of come to that realization. Do I want to do this or do I feel like I have the antibodies but I think the talking points have pushed this to a mandated level mm -hmm. which is where they want it because they want to see you know how they can control the population it's insane that and, and I do think there's a touch of that now I don't think it was there in the beginning I agree with you mm -hmm. I think it's there now and I think part of the problem with the left's approach to it is the same as their approach to gun control we're gonna alienate cops we're going to get them all fired. Mm -hmm. We're going to alienate military because they don't matter. We're going to alienate all these things, but we're going to seize your guns. Mm -hmm. Who's going to seize them? There's so, nobody left. There's nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. There's nobody yeah. left. And they're doing the same thing in the medical community. Right. Because like you said, they're trying to make a medical argument that's more of a legislative or legal one. And they're trying to cram it down every medical official's throat, firemen, everybody in the field. And they're trying to say, you have to eat this. And they're saying, well, just like you said, from the standpoint of how you're explaining it to me, that doesn't make sense. Right. And they're just trying to cram. So what are you going to do? Lose all the nurses, lose all the doctors. You'll never rebuild, build back better. It's more like shock and awe, destroy, yeah. you know, it's a blitzer creek on everybody. Totally. It, it, it's we're at the point now that everybody has become so tribal when it comes to this issue, especially when it comes mm. to the pandemic that, uh, you know, I I am on the right side of the aisle on I, I'm a libertarian. You know, I'm a, I'm a constitutionalist. I'm a libertarian. So I'm on I'm on the right side of the aisle on pretty much every single issue. Um and again, that's be, be, the libertarian streak in me is why I say I'm against mandates. Right? Mm. I want people to make their own. I would decision. think you'd like UBI then. Um, There's parts of it I like. Yeah, we can, that's that's a from a tax standpoint and from a from, yeah. There, there's I like it better. Let me put it this way to everybody listening because I know people will get on me about this. I like universal basic income from the standpoint of a welfare program. Right. Because I think the welfare programs we have are so corrupt and so bad. They are. But I do like UBI, but I don't think it should be a supplement to people's income forever. But I do see UBI okay. being something that does make sense on a small level. I just don't like... I, I, I think... This gets into a deeper conversation, but I think welfare has been bastardized in such a way that it, it's corrupt and it can be corrupted. Under UBI, I think you're able to clean all that up and you can eliminate some of those things, some yeah. of those programs. I think my, my issue with that's U what I like. About. I think my issue with UBI as a, as a libertarian is the reverse side of that coin. Yeah. That, that 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 money came from somewhere. Right. Right. So the libertarian in me, the hardcore libertarian in me, is like, uh, well, who did that money come from? Sure. And why did they have to give mm -hmm. up that money so that it could go into this UBI pile, right? Um, but when it comes to this issue of the pandemic, everybody's become so tribal about this that when I would speak up and say things like, you know, well, I am going to get the vaccine. Ah, uh, you know, peop mm. people scream, oh, now, now you must be on that side. We're going to push you over to that tribe. Right. When I said, uh, hey, there is zero data to show hydroxychloroquine works. When I said there's no good data to show that ivermectin is working. I got pushed over to the other side. Sure. Right. Now, I also wasn't, you know, I, I was actually early. It's funny how that works. <laughs> early, early on, I got asked about hydroxychloroquine and I said, okay, 
based on what little we know, because because at the thought at the time was it didn't have anything to do with viral load. It was right. more about your body's immune response. So an immune modulator, which we know hydroxychloroquine serves that role, right? It, it does for people with autoimmune diseases. Intuitively, yeah, that seems like it works. Symptom right? fixer, right? It blocks the yeah. cascade reaction. Maybe this is going to work, and then it didn't pan out. You know, so I had to say, oh, you know, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like it panned out, right? Monoclonal antibodies, which is was looked at as coming from from our tribe, right? Mm-hmm. Because Ron DeSantis was one of the first champions. Yep. Monoclonal antibodies are shit hot. You know, that's what I think. Uh, that's one of the keys that I think that and Rogan's health going into getting COVID, mm-hmm. his baseline health was pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact the press made a big deal oh. of the fact that he took ivermectin. I was over here applauding because he was taking monoclonal antibodies. I'm like, good for you, Joe. That's that's mm-hmm. you know that's that's great that's therapy. Great, great therapy, and it and it worked. You know, he got through it pretty well. Um, but again, I mean, we're all in our little camps mm. when it comes to these issues, and and I hate this is you know I'll I'll chime you know somebody will start banging the hydroxychloroquine drum again, and I'm like, all right, look, the Henry Ford study that you guys keep holding up, mm-hmm. they got better because of steroids. They didn't get better because of hydroxychloroquine. That's a flawed study. It's a piece of shit. Oh, and oh, by the way, it's published in a pay-for-play journal yep. that any, but that I could publish an article on the, crap rag, the different yep. smells of dog shit, and I mm-hmm. could get published in the same journal. Um, it's crap. Uh, and they start, blah, 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 and they start throwing out, you know, you know, when somebody starts throwing buzzwords at you in a an argument or in a discussion, you know you've pretty much won. Because right. factually, so ah, Fauci, 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 don't Fauci me. Yeah. We're in a private group on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not Fauci. To my knowledge, he's not in this group. He's not going to read it. So what, the only thing you're hoping to gain by throwing Fauci's at me is to make me, to push me into the other tribe, Sam in another tribe, so now you don't have to listen to me. I'm in your fucking tribe, okay? I'm trying to be the voice of sanity in this fucking tribe. You know, respect that. And, mm. and let me say my piece. Right. You know? No, I, I agree. And I, I think it's, I think for everybody, you know, to everybody listening, as far as getting the vaccine and all these things, I think they're personal decisions. I think doc does too. I think you have to look at the data. I think you have to analyze the data and you have to make a decision that's best for you and your family based on yeah. your situation. And everybody's situation is going to be different in how they present itself. And I know many of you are chiming in, in the comments below about whether you got it or you didn't. And that it's something I've been open about. I have no problem talking about, and I have my reasons. And being a healthy person, as you said, and having, whether it's available therapies or having the ability to get the vaccination, all those things are personal decisions. And, and, and I think that they should stay that way. Yeah. Now, the million dollar question is, is this a dress rehearsal for something bigger? And that's where the, the, the flat earth comes, you know, yeah. is this a dress rehearsal for uh, uh, no, no uh, crisis wasted type situation? Who, who knows? Yeah. You know, are, are they all, you know, we've had multiple crises crises i don't know how to say the plural of crisis um you know throughout my life so uh, you know uh, are they all just dress rehearsals for one another um i don't know you know so my frame of reference for that is how fucked up the united states military is on having to relearn the same lessons again and again and again Mm. right so that's a great canary in the coal mine right so the 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 u.s military we're constantly we're always fighting the war we just came out of okay not the one we fought two three wars ago right so we always have to relearn whether we're relearning jungle warfare or Mm -hmm. relearning arctic warfare or relearning desert warfare we're always relearning something we're always re you know relearning counterinsurgency operations right that we Mm -hmm. we should have had down relearning how to run partisans right which we learned in eastern europe right we're always relearning all this shit so if the U.S. military is that fucked up in having to relearn all these lessons, I have to assume, I, I cannot believe that elected officials who by and large are some dumb motherfuckers, oh. I cannot believe that they have some magical foresight and machinations to plan 20 years in advance and learn from all those things along the way. Yeah. Again, it goes, goes back to, you know, is it evil or is it stupid? They're probably. I don't think Nancy Pelosi's evil. I think she's selfish. I think she's greedy. But I think she's pretty stupid. Okay. I think a lot of these people in government are pretty fucking stupid. Oh, I I lose my mind, yeah. Doc, on this show when I hear them talk about gun rights. 
and the things that they battle for. We fought for a suppressor act that we, and I had Representative Stube on. I love the guy. Uh, we fought for a suppressor act when we should have been fighting for national reciprocity. Right. We, we fight for the wrong things, and a lot of that's dictated by talking points, and a lot of that's because, you know, people's friends go on national air and they push certain things that make no sense to push. But you see it all the time, and a lot of it has to, it, like, originally... And, and I don't want to digress, but originally, you know, Trump was going to put together these panels. Remember, he was going to put together the business panel that mm -hmm. worked for a little while. There was talk of him putting together a gun panel and people were going to be on it and, and they were going to talk about who it really affects. But I always talk about this in context of the gun industry. And I'm sorry to everybody if I'm losing my voice. I have allergies. It's terrible. But, um, you know we were supposed to have this panel that was going to speak to all the lawmakers and address some of the issues because a lot of them and buck sexton and i talked about this they're very casual gun owners they'll go to the range they'll shoot a few rounds they don't understand what really actually affects the community we're the only community in the national discussion that you never see an ffl or owner on tv so the person whose dollars are actually affected by the laws that are made mm -hmm. you don't see them on tv mm -hmm. that is mind-blowing to me mm -hmm. and we talked about this offline you always see like a seal or a special ops guy or whatever talking about the second amendment that makes no sense in any universe and if they went to work tomorrow to do an operation they're still going to have a gun whether the second amendment exists or doesn't because how do you have a military right so it doesn't make sense now yes they fight for the freedoms and they can have that conversation but i think it's so much more poignant when it comes from somebody whose money is affected by the situation yeah. and i think that there's been this this almost national silencing of the actual people that are affected by these things because they don't want to have the passion to come through in the conversation so i have my own issues with how every national topic's discussed mm -hmm. and i do think by and large many of your lawmakers it's not necessarily that they lack intelligence and I'm going they're, to be cautious with that. They're <laughs> misinformed. They're, mis they're misinformed. They're misinformed yeah. and they're handed a sheet with bullet points on it mm -hmm. about a particular issue. I've seen them, guys. Full disclosure, I've worked campaigns. Some of you know this. I don't like to get into it on yeah. air, which ones. It's but called, It's called a one-pager. Yeah, it's called yeah. a one-pager <laughs> and they, they just read off a sheet. Yeah. And then some of them will go to Taron Tactical and shoot some rounds and some of them will go here and they're bona fide in the gun industry. Yeah. That's what create it creates an animal. And a lot of them just are advocates created by the NRA. And that's where some of the conversation goes awry. It's no different in any other community. That's why you see a lot of great lawmakers, the good ones. The first question they're asking out of the shoot with a lot of these medical questions is where do you practice medicine? Mm -hmm. And none of them do. A lot right. of them don't. Right. So they're speaking from... Well, I don't, sir. You see these clips play over and over. Bongino does a good job of getting them out there. Danny does a good job. Yeah. But you see these over and over again. It's because they're pundits. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they're pundits out there talking and taking up space. Yeah. And that's what a lot of it is. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. I don't know how to reconcile it. No, know? it's, you know, and, and it, the last couple of years has illustrated it more than anything. Mm. It's, and I think it would have, the pandemic, I think, provided a, a huge amplification for that. I think we would have seen it regardless. But another thing that, and we kind of we kind of glossed over this. We know we talked about masks and we talked about vaccinations and and mandates and why you and I both dislike them. Uh, a message that never got hit home it, through all this, and Rogan's talked about this mm. is, through everything. What they should have been saying is, "Hey, look, everybody, everybody, stop what you're doing and look. Look at the people who are having the hardest time of this. Look at the people on ventilators. Look at the people in the ICU. What do they have in common?" Yes, they have COVID in common, but they also have in common they were overweight. They weren't living properly, right? They weren't healthy. You're not seeing, nobody finished a Spartan race mm. and got admitted to the ICU that I know of, right? So what are we doing for that now? Because we can start addressing that. We talk about, mm. we talk about at the grassroots yeah. level, how do, we, how do we address racism? We talk about the gra at the grassroots level, how do we address climate change? What are we talking about at the grassroots level? How do affect health so if there is another pandemic that comes behind this one how are we going to how are we going to address that and people need to start getting healthy and you know and what what ended up, what happened especially in the blue states mm. gyms closed stupid right the the one time that people and and honestly had gyms not closed because so many people were working from home i think this would have been 
a linchpin moment in our society when people would have a lot of people would have rediscovered working out. And I think a lot of people actually did. I think people did. Too. You know, I mean, if you look at how hard it was to mm -hmm. buy a set of um, dumbbells, Jeez. Uh, that, you know, I've got the adjustable dumbbells that I've had for years. You couldn't buy those online. I'm sold out. You know, these uh, these things that it's the the little mirror screen that you work off of at home. Those are sold out. Uh, my gym had to close down for a while, and they gave people the opportunity. Hey, we're gonna we'll let you basically rent. You want to take a rower home? Take a rower home. Yeah. You want to take the ski erg home? Take the ski erg home. I already had stuff at home, so I didn't need to do that. But a lot of people were, and a lot of people got in better shape. And yeah. I, and I hope <clears throat> that people will come out of this and look at, hey, you know, guess what? No matter what we're talking, even if we're talking about you getting hit by a fucking car or shot in the chest, the healthier you are when that happens, mm. all right, that affects to an extent, your survivability, but it oh. definitely affects your rehab and your recovery. Right? 100%. Obviously, somebody shoots you right in the 10 ring. That's, you know, I don't, I don't care how much you can squat. That's that's going to do you <laughs> in. Um, but, you know, you, you know, guys that we see get really screwed up, even in trauma, if they have a better baseline health. Diabetics, a diabetic gets hit by a car or is in a car wreck, they end up on the ICU, a complete train wreck because their, yeah. their, their kidneys were already walking this fine line. Their heart was already on this fine line. Vascularly, they're, they're terrible. They have distal neuropathy already. It, it's a nightmare. It's yeah. a, they're, they're a nightmare for everything bad in the recovery phase. They just are. Yeah. Uh, really terrible infections. If you got to put, if you got to put pins in a, in a diabetic's bone somewhere to, to, so that they'll heal right, it's a recipe for badness later on. So the better off your baseline health is going going into this, the better you're going to be. Yeah, if you're good guys, if you're going up two flights of stairs and you're winded, it's time to reconsider some shit. Yeah. I mean, COVID's the least of your worries at that point. Yeah. I mean, you have greater issues in play. Uh, if you have and you suffer from an, an ongoing illness, I would like to think, I'm not a doctor, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, you need to go and get some get something done whether yeah. it's taking your blood pressure down getting into a regimen these are all things you have to consider and that's i think what doc is trying to say you know the greater the issues that you have ongoing the more problems you're going to have in recovery and in everything else and you have to consider those things yeah. and for the lay person i would say two to three flights of stairs if you're gassed and you need to sit down use that as a benchmark you need to you need to get some help the problem is, is we've, and I, and I talk about this in the book, that we've, we've come to embrace what, what is average, and we, we have equated that to being normal, mm -hmm. is the average person is overweight, the average person is not in a good state of cardiovascular fitness, the average person, uh, by the time they're 40 or 50 years old, is going to be on at least a couple of prescription medications and be dependent on those medications, and that's average, but that's not normal. Right. You know, and I, and I talk about that in the book, that, you know, if... If you're taking care of yourself, then you're going to be less dependent on the medical industrial complex. Of course. You know, the, the old, the, I think it was a Thomas Edison quote that unfortunately has never come to pass. You know, the doctor of the future will, will doctor you through diet and lifestyle and exercise, not through medications. I wish that was the case today. Right. In a very small niche, it is the case, but on the wider scale, it's not. And the reason is the same people that, you know, we like our Uber Eats. We like our drive-through. We like uh, our streaming services at home. Mm. If, if we have to wait more than just a few minutes for something, you know, it's we just consider that to be crazy that we had to wait that long, right? So you want everything right now. So you don't want to go to the doctor and say, all right, here's a plan on how you're going to get in better shape over the next six or nine months. We're going to implement this and we're going to see how you do. You don't want that. You want a, here's a pill to make up for the fact that you won't do what I tell you to do. Right. So this pill is going to cure you, all right? And it's not, this is another instance where uh, a lot of distrust has been mm. shined on the medical community because it's like, well, it's a business. The medical community is a business. They're, you're a customer. They want you coming back. So they just right. rather give you pills. It's not, that doctor is not sitting there going, God, I'm going to make so much money if this guy's blood pressure stays up and all I got to do is give him medication, ka-ching, right. this is going to put my kids through college. That's not what he, that doctor's thinking. The doctor's thinking, you know what? I've had this clean your life up conversation thousands of times with thousands mm. of patients over the years and they never listen to me and I'm just tired of it. Yeah. Because you know what? You're not going to listen to me. So I'm going to give you, because that, that conversation is exhausting, 
I'm going to give you this pamphlet, which you're not going to fucking read. <laughs> okay. It's going to, it's, you're going to, it's going to go home and it's going to sit there and, and by the, by where the, it'll phone go in a be. basket. Yeah. Somewhere. But that stupid fucking basket we've all got, I've got that basket too, <laughs> full of fucking shit. And then it's going to get thrown away. Right. Along with the flyer from the kid down the street that does dog sitting. <laughs> It's going to get thrown away. You're not going to read that, right? right? Even though it's it's got so really good bullet points on how to get your shit under control. You're just not going to do it. You're going to take these pills. And I've conditioned you to believe that those pills are a cure. And it's it, it's ingrained so much into people's psyche now that they come to me in the emergency room and I say, do you have any medical problems? No, sir. You're on five different medications. Well, yeah, I don't have those problems anymore because I take the medications. Oh, no, 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 no. You... You have high blood pressure. You have high blood sugar. You have all these, you have high cholesterol. We didn't cure you, okay? This is making your lab values look nice. They cure the symptoms. Right. But you still have that issue. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to get that issue under control? Yeah. And uh, it's just, it's a conversation that a lot of people in healthcare are just tired of having. And, it, we're, and we're hamstrung by the fact that uh, I, there's, a, there's a graph out there. You can Google it and find it. Um, exponentially the administrators in healthcare have just shot up like the number of people providing direct patient care is not largely changed over mm. the last 30 years you know i mean it's gone up but it's steady it's not a, not a big peak the people in administration so the people who work in coding billing the people who are basically running that hospital and telling the doctors how what they can do and how they see patients those individuals have gone ex up exponentially and they're the ones that tell a family practitioner an internist a general practitioner all right you have 15 minutes to see a patient and five minutes to write your note wow and that's what you have mm. right and then people wonder why i had a 2 30 doctor's appointment i didn't get in there till 4 30. well how when you were in the room with that doctor how much of his time did you want when he started getting when he did that I'm, st I'm doing with my body language. I'm standing up and putting my hand on the doorknob. When he did that at 12 minutes in, how long did you keep talking? Because, hey, you were there for a legitimate concern and you wanted his or her mm. time. Okay, I, I, I guess I'm being a little misogynist referring to the physician as him. Um, everybody does that and you're entitled to mm -hmm. do that, but you need to recognize that's out of that physician's control. Mm -hmm. but these are being dictated to us that you only have this much time for a patient visit. So, when you're standing there talking to a patient and you're like, I'm five charts behind and I'm three hours behind. I have a bunch of shit that I, I got to, I got to go see the next patient. I got to write my notes. I got all this shit to do. I could sit down with you and roll a chair over and have a heart to heart about setting up your exercise program and setting up your diet program. But here's the fucking pamphlet and here's a prescription for your bottle of whatever. Right. Because I just, it's so late in the day so late in my career mm -hmm. i just don't have time and that's tragic right and that's that's one of the things i it, sometime in the next year or so uh i want to be doing some concierge medicine where i am seeing patients and i'm acting as more or less as a primary care physician i want to get uh into providing hormone replacement and, and testosterone replacement to guys who are the target of my book and i want to be doing that in a concierge format where i'm free to have that time and have that conversation if somebody comes to me and it's their first time seeing me and they're like doc i'm on this many medications and i've been told i shouldn't do this shouldn't do that shouldn't do that we can do a deep dive into it and take the time and get them through that yeah and get them off of those medications but not every physician especially if you're working for one of these groups yeah and because you're getting hammered with the metrics you know i worked uh my first job getting out of the military i went to work for uh one of these big companies that that does the staffing for a bunch of emergency rooms and uh i was getting calls on my day off hey you remember that uh 57 year old guy with chest pain you saw which one that's like 10 of my patients i don't know who you're talking about so-and-so, so-and-so, yeah, okay, what about it? So you didn't check this block on it, but we noticed on the test results, this was there. So, you know, you really should have checked that block because when it right. comes to billing, it's like, and I'm, did the patient have a bad outcome? Well, no. Then what, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't understand what, you know, was the patient dissatisfied? Oh, no, they actually wrote a letter saying how, what a, how great you were. All right, well, I think we're done talking then. Yeah. Because you're, you know, I, I came into this to deliver medical care, not to fret over, admin bullshit yeah i used to have a, a saying when i was chief of department of emergency medicine at darnell i used to have a saying in meetings i said you can't make me care about shit that doesn't matter yeah you just can't yeah and uh whether or not i checked this little block 
that means we got to bill an extra $17 or we got credit on some mm. federal oversight that wants to make sure that we're doing that, right? I don't, I don't care about that. Yeah. Right? I, you know, I care about, I did the best possible patient care for that patient who was in front of me. And when I walked out of that room, even if they didn't like me, they knew that you know their health was my number one concern. You're going to do it right while I was in that room, and I've had I've had people say you know I've I've had patients write uh, letters to the hospital or fill out cards. He's an asshole, but I knew he cared. Yeah, you know, rather and have that. that. Yeah, because you know, and I've delivered tough love to patients. You know, I've told patients, you've been in here four different times for four un four un four seemingly unrelated complaints, but guess what the issue is? You're fat. Yeah. Yeah. And well, what do I do? Nobody's ever told me that. This is, this is what you do, right? Yeah. Here's, here's some general guides. Here's a, here's a, you know, get your phone out. Here's a website that you're going to go to show you how to structure your diet. So you're going to put your weight in. It's going to tell you how many calories, you can t all this stuff. And sometimes those result in patient complaints. Sometimes those result in patients writing glowing letters to mm -hmm. the hospital on, Hey, I've lost 30 pounds. And it was and all, all because Dr. Simpson basically didn't care what i thought about him on that day and had the balls to fucking tell me to my face what was wrong and and i'll and i'll say it dog it, it, this is something i gotta say even the time i spent in the hospital it's real simple the you know go on entresto and spend 500 a month or go and sign up for a meal plan get a low salt diet yeah start to filter that stuff out cut down on your fluids take care of your body and you'll be healthier yeah. I mean, it's just, there's no question. I mean, that was my situation being very candid. Yeah. But uh, again, when you, you know, these things will happen, whether they're hereditary or that you get an illness or something creeps in your life. I know uh, Daryl chimed in having cancer and certain things. And there are things that sometimes are a little bit out of your control. They kind of creep up on you, but you can fix them. Yeah. Yeah. You can legitimately fix them, not mask them. Yeah. Not hide the symptoms. You can fix them. We could, you and I could get up in here right now, walk out of here, walk to the nearest emergency room. We could go look, you know, and somewhere in that emergency room, right, there's an electronic board that lists all the patients. And I could go down the list of those patients and I could, and I guarantee you, three quarters, three quarters of the patients that are in that emergency room right now are there for something that is lifestyle related. Yep. Okay. Whether that, and sometimes at two o'clock in the morning, that lifestyle related is, uh, I was selling drugs on the corner and I got shot, right? yeah. but it's still lifestyle related. Yep. Uh, sometimes the lifestyle related is, uh, I eat three bacon cheeseburgers a day. Yeah. You know, it, it depends on the individual, but that's, we, as a, as a mechanism of healthcare here in the United States, that's primarily what we're treating is we're, tr we're treating developed world lifestyle issues, right? Is, is it's not, we're not treating starvation and vitamin deficiency and brittle bones because there's you know nobody's getting milk yeah. we're not we're not te teaching you know we're not treating uh, outbreaks of terrible childhood diseases we're treating mostly lifestyle stuff yeah so. it's uh, that's one of the you know that was a powerful lot to unpack there for everybody listening but i hope you paid attention or run it back and check it out i want to thank everybody in the comments i want to say not only is this guy a doctor Okay, he's a he's a former Green Beret. I mean, tremendous accolades, author, all the things. And he's a fan of the Geeks and Gamers. Fuck yeah. We talked about this <laughs> earlier. I had no idea. One of the things he brought up to me right away was 3PO who's in here. What's yeah. up, Jay? And Nerdrotic and all the guys. So he is a fan. Yeah. So yeah. support him. Go check his book out. Go check out his pages. He's got an Instagram. Eric shared it in the chat. Guys, Daryl, I know you've been sharing the stuff. Go check out the book. It's really great. It's called Honed. Uh, awesome read. I got a little ways into it. I am going to finish it. He, I was fortunate to get a signed copy from the good doctor. Guys, check it out. Are you offering signed copies on Amazon or anywhere else? I'm not. On, website, on, on yeah. Amazon, there's not really a mechanism for it. I could probably do something like uh, like my good buddy Tim does. It's like he's, you know, He says, hey, you mail me anything with a self-addressed envelope, and I'll oh, and send it, it back. So I'll, pr I'll probably set something like that up in the near future. Yeah, there you have yeah. it. Hopefully on the website soon, you'll be able to snatch this up. But uh, let everybody know where they can find you, how they can reach you, and how they can get in touch. So uh, I've got two websites, my, my legacy website, which is drmikesimpson.com, uh, which I started some time ago. Primarily, I'm spending most of my time on my business website, which, was, which is graybeardperformance.com. That's my life and lifestyle brand for, for dudes over 40 who still want to be savages. That's where I sell my supplements, my geese, my rash guards, my apparel, 
Uh, there's a link to the book, uh, but you can just go to Amazon and get the book as well. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Dr. Mike Simpson, D R M I K E S I M P S O N. And Graybeard Performance also has its own Instagram account. Try to give Graybeard Performance a follow if you don't mind. I'm trying to bump those numbers up. Yeah, and uh, I know everybody's chiming in now down below. Please head over to the pages, guys. Give him some activity, give him some comments, share some of the stuff in your stories. Help this guy out. He is a fan of the geekdom. <laughs> so we appreciate well, I'm that. A, I'm a member of the geekdom. I'm uh, for those. So maybe there's probably some people listening that can there appreciate are. this. Uh, I am replaying through. They they released uh, Diablo two for for uh, for console now. Yeah. Mm. So I'm I'm replaying Diablo two on the Xbox because back when it was a PC game, it got me through some real rough times. Yeah. So I'm kind of reliving that now. So. Blizzard got real woke. They yeah. Turned in, yeah. They turned into a bunch of douche. But, but 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 the old the school Diablo. Awesome. So yeah. have you Diablo Four? Mm. I don't know if you've seen any of the clips from it. It looks pretty badass. Yeah, I think I think I, I still like Blizzard, but they they've gotten woke and weird. But then again, ha so is half of Hollywood, and so has half of geekdom. And we're fighting the good fight, and my foot soldiers are out there working tirelessly to bring a result. <laughs> so hopefully, we'll win back the. Uh, the streaming waves i appreciate everybody i appreciate you coming on man it, it's listen we went long but i'm not mad at it thank you i mean it it is a great conversation and a few of the guys have chimed in some great clips go check out gray beard i'll put some of the links down below uh doc thank you thank you i bro. mean it appreciate you for having coming me in i appreciate it this was a good conversation everybody listening please Remember to like and subscribe. Your support is everything. Thank you. I want to thank a few of the sponsors for you guys. I know uh, Eric's done a great job listening to him. Daryl, go check him out. Inforce, Pulsar, Sig Sauer, Right on Optics. Please go check out some of these sponsors. Gallo Technologies, Rhino Metals, Blackwater Ammunition, Galco Leather Holsters, Volquartz and Firearms. All the sponsors, guys. Go comment on their stuff. Go share their stuff. We really appreciate the support. Guys, rock. I love you guys. Any reviews, any shares are greatly appreciated. Dr. Mike, again, thank you. Thank you, brother. We're out.